And now we are coming back uh, to pro uh, cons uh, session as to uh, reflux disease. Tomica, please uh, come to the panel. You will be a chairperson. Пожалуйста, вы тоже. Николай, проходите в президиум. Did we have two lectures, pro and cons, regarding long-term PPI therapy? And I'd like first to invite Professor Marco Bruno to speak about long-term medical therapy versus surgical in the spectrum of reflux and uh, disease in Barrett. Pro long-term medical therapy. Marco, would you like here or here? <laughs> uh, yes. Okay. So we continue with um, Barrett's. If I can have my first slide. Пожалуйста, из предыдущей секции слайд Марко Бруно. Which um, talk is kind of an extension of what I already um, um, alluded to, um, and I'm going to uh, be much in favor, much, much in favor, for prolonged term medical therapy, and we will see what that means. Um, we already talked about ways to prevent morbidity and mortality in Barrett's esophagus, uh, in particular the early detection of um, any relevant lesion that might be, of course, a very early adenocarcinoma, but preferably low-grade or high-grade dysplasia. Um, but despite all this, um, um, Barrett's cases, but also the incidence of uh, esophageal anocarcinoma has been ri rising rapidly in the Western world. And we tried to reverse the Barrett's epithelium, as we already saw, with endoscopic means. We saw a beautiful video using the radiofrequency ablation. But before all that, there is also a case to be made for good chemo prevention. And with chemo prevention, I'm talking about different classes of drugs, um, protopump inhibitor, most importantly, but also NSAIDs and statins. Um, we already alluded to this, and there was a question uh, during of, after my last talk about this issue of acid exposure, um, and I already gave uh, some more insights into the importance of a continuous exposure of acid in the distal esophagus, and that that is what we have to control, and that is also the reason why we have to give continuous um, um, drug uh, for the, uh, to, for, to increase the pH in the distal esophagus rather than uh, on-demand kind of therapy. Um, all this issue with regard to the uh, uh, sensitivity of cells in the distal esophagus to become hyperproliferative on the basis of a decreased pH that has been very well established in both cell lines, experimental cell lines, but also in vivo experiments in animals and, in fact, in humans. Um, now, this is a, a study that, that we performed and that was published in, in uh, um, um, clinical gastroenterology pathology a few years ago. As I already alluded to, there are no, no truly randomized controlled trials in Barrett. So that class A evidence just does not exist. So the best uh, available evidence that we have then is what we could call prospective case control series. And that is what we have been doing and are doing right now in my clinic. And here you see a cohort of, uh, of almost 600 patients that we followed. And there were 540 patients that did not progress to high-grade dysplasia or cancer. And there were 40 cases that did progress to high-grade uh, dysplasia or cancer. And what you can see, whether they took a, a, a H2 receptor antagonist, that did not matter. Um, that did not help in preventing progression. But if you look at PPI, you can see that the, um, the, uh, the hazard ratio with um, the, pa the patients, in particular those that were current users of PPI, and that was the majority, 85%, the hazard ratio is 0.43. Statistics significant, and in my opinion also clinically relevant. And in particular importance is also that we did a time-dependent analysis, and it also showed that this time dependency, so the longer you use um, PPIs to control uh, your gastric acid um, production and the reflux the better. And by the way, we, we did check this very carefully because of all these patients, we got the reports of the pharma pharmacist and we checked whether the patient really got their recipes and took the medication. So I think this is 
the best we can achieve with regard to looking into the issue of PPI use and progression in Barrett's. Now, we did some more analysis there. We looked at the different brands of PPIs. And Lanzoprazole didn't do that good, but it was also used by the minority of patients. You can see the duration matters. The adherence, of course, matters greatly. But the dose, whether you took 40 or higher, that did not matter. So 40 milligrams of a PPI taken constantly without intermissions uh, in a patient with Barrett's uh, with good adherence seems to matter with regard to having progression to high-grade dysplasia or cancer or not. This is probably the most convincing figure that I would like to show you. This is something that we published uh, also in the same publication in uh, clinical gastroenterology and hepatology, where you see in this graph on the y-axis the cumulative incidence of high-grade dysplasia or esophageal cancer, on the x-axis the duration of follow-up, and you can see that's quite considerable, more than seven years, and the uh, black dark line is what we observed in uh, those patients that uh, did not use PPIs and in the gray line, the lower line, you see the incidence in those that did use PPI. And that is a statistically significant difference and again I would argue also a clinically relevant difference. Now multiple studies have uh, uh, given support to the use of chemo prevention in all kinds of cancers, um, in particular for NSAIDs and statins, so it will be very interesting also to see if that has a role in patients with Barrett's esophagus, where we would try then to um, um, prevent progression towards high-grade dysplasia or cancer. Um, and there were some observational studies already um, looking into this, and we kind of looked into our own cohort with regard to this, because what you want to do is you want to kind of prevent inflammation and proliferation of apoptosis, COX-1, COX-2, that you do with NSAIDs. On the other hand, you want to do this also with HM reductase that you can achieve with statins. So there is a um, theoretical reasoning and also some practical reasoning from um, not only animal studies, but also human studies, kind of case series, to do this. So how would this then end up if you do the analysis in a prospective case control study? Now, I'm not going to go in, in, in too much detail. I just want to show this for NSAIDs first. Uh, you can see here for NSAIDs, any use or median duration of use, which is relatively low in patients, in the score of 570 patients. And you see that the hazard ratio is 0.5. It's statistically significant, but you can see there's a large confidence interval, so there is some issue with regard to this, but at least there seems to be an effect of this. If you look here at the cumulative incidence, kind of the same graph I showed you with PPIs, but now with NSAIDs, you can see that uh, the uh, people that used NSAIDs, which is the, um, l the, the lighter blue line, had a, um, a markedly lower rate of um, progression to high-grade dysplasia or cancer as compared to those who did not use this. And if you then combine this into a graph where we both use, uh, look at patients, whether they use uh, NSAID or statins, then the combined effect of statins is even also statistically significant. And patients that used PPIs, statins, and NSAIDs had a markedly and statistically lower risk of progression to high-grade dysplasia and cancer. So to come to my conclusion in this short talk, is a use of PPIs reduces the risk of neoplastic progression by 80% in um, this study. PPI uses the risk of progression is further reduced by prolonged use and good adherence uh, because you need this continuous uh, inhibition of acid reflux. Use of NSAIDs reduce the risk again by 50% and the combined use of NSAID and statins had a reduced risk of 75%. So to come back to the title of my talk, should we do this medical treatment to reduce the risk of Barrett's progression? Yes, we should, for sure, with protopom inhibitors. And I'm up for discussion with regard to NSAIDs or statins. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. Oh, sorry. Ну, коллеги, у нас такая дискуссия между терапевтом и... Коллеги, мы have a discussion between a surgeon and a therapist. We plan to make such a discussion how the medical therapy affects the progression of the disease. But life is life, and the surgeon that had to speak... 
uh, had an urgent situation, and he entrusted his uh, colleague uh, to present this information. That's why let us listen to his uh, concept. Uh, so do you have a presentation without any presentation? OK, you have your own concept. Very good. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you very much for your great presentation, very fundamental uh, and interesting uh, material about uh, this uh, really important disease. Because now in Russia and especially in Moscow, it's uh, really highly represented and more than 23% uh, of our uh, citizens uh, feel some symptoms of this disease. Uh, and also I would like to congratulate uh, you and other uh, therapy specialists uh, because now we uh, can assume that uh, therapy is really uh, winning this game. Because we know that if previously uh, these uh, surgical procedures for uh, gastroesophageal reflux were really common uh, and we knew that uh, it was uh, even uh, possibly one way to treat the patient, now it's not like that. So we have uh, very good contemporary uh, therapy for this uh, PPI and others uh, more, uh, even more efficient. And uh, now we can uh, say that uh, only uh, possible uh, indications for surgical procedure is a complicated uh, variant of this disease, uh, such as uh, strong esophagitis that is uh, not possible to be treated by uh, therapy. Also, uh, strictures of esophagus and uh, uh, barred esophagus, uh, according to the very high risk of uh, progression into uh, malignant disease. Uh, that's why um, uh, this should be considered uh, always as a uh, continuous speech between uh, surgeon and uh, gastroenterologist and uh, first of all we uh, should uh, use all the opportunities uh, not to uh, perform surgery because uh, as we say now a good surgery is uh, the surgery that uh, can be avoided <laughs> that's why we uh, may say that um, we hope uh, for the further development uh, of uh, therapy in this uh, region of uh, gastroenterology and um, of course we uh, also develop our methods of uh, surgical treatment uh, such as uh, minimally invasive approach, uh, laparoscopic procedures, robotic procedures for uh, Nissen fund application, now it's uh, commonly used. Also in our clinic constitution we perform it with uh, Robert da Vinci so we can um, uh, make uh, less uh, trauma for the patient mm. and uh, the decision of the patient that is also very important now uh, can uh, uh, grow further and uh, the patient can think that this surgery is not something very dangerous but it's uh, better for him if uh, he really has some indications uh, for example uh, as we understand uh, this therapy uh, like PPI or others uh, has some limitations for example a pregnant patient uh, who want to uh, have uh, children and uh, she can't uh, receive them all the time or uh, maybe uh, some people who are afraid of uh, some possible um, recurrence of uh, barred disease so they can have uh, this fear and uh, sometimes surgery like some kind of radical treatment uh, as they feel can be more preferable, uh, especially uh, nowadays when it's minimally invasive. So that's uh, something that I can conclude about that. <laughs> we have not much. much of a discussion, I guess. <laughs> I think we kind of agree. I, I, there is, there is, I, I, don't, I, don't, I do agree with you. you of course, there, there can be a case in, in certain patients um, where um, adherence to therapy is an issue where you might, you know, you might refer to surgery. Um, again, I cannot recollect, recollect out of my memory that I sent a patient for surgery, to be quite honest. Um, and it's, and it's particular because we have these protopop inhibitors. If we were talking about the H2 receptor antagonist, that was a whole different ball game, of course. Of course, for sure. Thank you very much. I don't like you to agree too much. <laughs> <laughs> I was afraid of that. There is no discussion. I still, probably once or twice a year, uh, sorry, uh, once every other year, refer someone to a specialist surgeon who does about 120 reflux surgeries in, in Hamburg. And these are patients, it's not an issue of compliance, but it's an issue of concern of taking PPIs for more than 10 years because uh, you get bone fractures, you have a higher rate of uh, pulmonary infections, and all the late and latent side effects of 
very prolonged PPI mm -hmm. use. The other th issue is if patient has an axial hiatus hernia and uh, he doesn't have a sphincter anymore, he suffers from reflux which goes beyond acid because physiologically whenever you have a, a phase three digestive phase you have bile in your stomach and the bile flows mm -hmm. up and PPIs don't do anything against bile reflux and if these patients have esophagitis or strong symptoms, if they have a hiatus hernia, I think we still need to discuss surgery. It, it may not no, you're it right. may not prevent progression of Barrett's esophagus mm -hmm. if they have one, but that's usually not the issue. So please, no, but again, logger I... your heads about the potential of surgery in those <laughs> cases. Of course. Well, I think, I think that there could be a case there. I have some reservation in the sense that um, this type of surgery, at least in the Netherlands, is not performed very often at all. Um, and you are a surgeon, you have to correct me if I'm wrong, but I have always been learned by surgeons that this operation might not be the most difficult operation, but you need practice and you need a good eye to be able to do a good job for the patient. Yeah. Uh, so that means if I send a patient to a surgeon who does only one or two per year, that's probably not a good idea. No, so then I have to sure. select somebody, and I, 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 I got a name of a good surgeon of in the region, not in the Netherlands, but in Germany, where then I would probably likely to refer that patient because, um, again, sur surgery can sometimes be a good solution, but I have also cases that had surgery in the past but have all kinds of other problems that yeah, we have to deal with that. as gastroenterologists. So... Of course, very good point, and uh, this is why we uh, try to gather this patient in uh, so-called high-volume centers, where uh, surgeons perform these procedures uh, more than five times a week to be... Uh, That's a lot of experience, yeah. yeah. Right. Yeah. The, the other thing is what I... I want to make a strong case for, for PPIs, despite more knowledge that we are acquiring nowadays with regard to the potential side effects of prolonged PPI use, which, which I think you have to take into consideration and you have to, um, to also you know, tell the two patients. With regard to NSAIDs and statins, I think that is, should be regarded as circumstantial evidence. That was found in this cohort because we had these patients and they use concomitant NSAIDs and statins for whatever reason, and we could kind of dig into that. But I would not like to make a case to start prescribing NSAIDs or statins to every patient with Barrett's. I think that's too soon now, yeah. and in all probability, probability, I believe it will be too soon anyhow for the near future. So PPIS, statins, NSAIDs, very interesting, but not to be prescribed. There is also one small niche in adverse effect of PPIs after 10 or 15 years. There is a possibility of multiple fundi gland polyposis as a serious problem and kind of dependency on PPIs. I'm recalling from my memory the last patient who I referred to surgeon for laparoscopic fund application that was patient with reflux disease, which is serious one, 15 years long-term PPI therapy without any possibility to stop or to switch to H2 blockers or simple to alginate. And our surgeons perform laparoscopically fund application and now he's free of drugs without any complication of the operation. I think that we shouldn't be black and white. There is a space, but I agree that is not simply pro and cons. This is cons with pro, but exceptionally cons. <laughs> Thank you so much for such discussion. Uh, I think uh, you... Uh, we can become friends, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. It's okay, it's great. Uh, so our friendship enables us to have some lunch. To lunch. I want to make a big compliment to the simultaneous translators. Yeah, right. You guys there are terrific. Thank you very much. Спасибо. <laughs> Thank you very much. I announce uh, 30 minutes for lunch break.